Now, maybe there's a couple of things we should do before we get started, though. Um, I wonder when you saw what we were going to do today, and you saw it was going to be a workshop, and did that signal to you, oh, maybe Nancy's not going to do all the talking, maybe like I'm going to have to do something, and if so, that was, that was right, that was right. Um, we're, we're going to be working together today. We're going to have some engaged learning today. And I know that, though, for some of you, that might have, maybe that created a little bit of anxiety right here. Maybe you come in today and you're thinking to yourself, I'm about to be exposed for everything I don't know about the Bible. <laughs> and if so, you know, this anxiety that you feel May, it's not going to work well for you today. We just need to get rid of it. Okay. So do you have your hand? Can you do like this with your hands toward me? All right. Let's just, let's just gather up any anxiety that might be in there and we're going to throw it out those back doors. All right. Cause yeah, because don't need it because you know why? Because we're all here as learners today, wherever you are, we want to take a step forward. Um, I, every time I do this, I learn something. And I anticipate that will be the same today. So we're all just here together as learners, seeking to get a bit, little bit better grip on the Bible. All right. Um, now, there may be others of you, when you read it was going to be a workshop, and you thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to do some stuff. Maybe there are others of us who thought, oh, 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 oh this is going to be great. Um, I'm going to get to show everyone how much I know about the Bible. <laughs> And if so, that's not going to work well for you today either, all right? So it's probably that girl next to you who's thinking that, but just in case, I want you to go like this, all right? And just like gather up any pride or ego about your Bible knowledge. We're going to throw that out the window too, okay? Just get rid of it because it's not going to serve us well. All right, now, be um, before we start talking about my topic today, and, and, and I'm going to use a term, biblical theology, today, which is really at the heart of what we're doing. We're, we're talking about the Bible's big story. And biblical theology, when I use that term, I'm talking about the Bible's big story. But before I get into even into more of defining that, I want us to think together for a minute about books and stories in general and how they work. Okay, so if you open up your workbook on this first page, if you got it turned here, and you can see that it has a little thing. It says plot versus theme. Do you see that? And then I have a definition of plot. Plot is the series of events and happenings that make up the story, or plot consists of events. So let's just do a little exercise to test if we, if we get what is being said here. That every book or story is going to have a storyline. And most books and stories work the same way. You get introduced to some characters and a setting. And then there's what we call developing action. And somewhere along here, there's a crisis. Do you guys watch Hallmark movies here? Some of you, yeah, okay. And you know, you know what I'm talking about, Hallmark movies, they all follow this pattern, right? There's, there's a setting in the country store or whatever, right, you know? And there's a crisis, like she's come to the little town, but she's going to move back to the big city, and what's going to happen, right? All right, so there's a crisis, and then there's more developing action, and then it, it comes up to a climax where the crisis is dealt with. Which way is it going to go? Is she staying in town or is she leaving, right? And then it, it resolves into usually they're going to get married happily ever after kind of thing, right? Okay. So that's kind of how all stories work. So we're going to, we're going to test this. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you the name of a story that I think most of you will know. And I want you to turn to a partner and for you both to just throw out who are some of the characters in it. And if you were telling the storyline, what are some things that happen as this story develops? Now you're not going to have time to tell the whole story, but just, will you give that a try? I mean, this is, the, this is that awkward world moment where you look at somebody and go, will you be my partner? Okay, oh, okay, all right. All right, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I want you to throw out to each other um, some uh, events in the storyline of the story, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. All right, go for it, go.
All right, ladies. Enough of Beauty and the Beast. Okay, come back to me. All right, so we have some characters in this story. Who's, who's an important character we're introduced to in the story? What's her name? And if, do I have some French speakers who know what her name means? Beauty. Beauty. Exactly. And then uh, there's her father. And uh, there is this prince on whom has been cast this spell, right? And so there's a crisis right there that's going to need to be dealt with. But um, there's another crisis. I remember dad goes off and he gets captured by the beast, right? And he's there and she's got to go and she trades for him. All right. All right. So um, so that's how the story goes, right? And, um, and the crisis is that uh, the beast can't turn into a prince until what? Anybody remember? <laughs> True love's kiss, remember? Right? And so, will it happen? Because it's not going well. And then we come to the climax of the story, which is... <laughs> True love's kiss, right? And then the story resolves, and they get married and live happily ever after, right? All right, so... That gives us a sense of plot or storyline. All right, let's look at this n other aspect of stories, a theme. And we read, theme is the central message conveyed through a piece of writing. Theme consists of a message. So the person who wrote Beauty, on the Be Beauty and the Beast probably had a, a message they wanted to communicate in the story. It wasn't just a nice story. Um, and, and whereas plot or storyline, we would need a lot of words to communicate that. Theme can often be conveyed in maybe one word or just a few words. All right, so my lady's way over there. Somebody throw out to me, what might be a theme of the story, Beauty and the Beast? Got one? Love, like it, here. Inner beauty, inner beauty, like it. Kindness, redemption. All right, you're, you're getting the idea, right? So the, the author has something they want to communicate. Now, especially like this inner beauty, and let's say inner beauty versus outer beauty, because we see both. Remember that character, Gaston? Yeah. And remember, he's like, oh, uh, but inside he's like vacuous, right? Or even the beast. Um, you know, he has no outer beauty, but we slowly discover there is some inner beauty. Now, I want you to imagine you'd never heard this story, Beauty and the Beast. And uh, so you were either reading the book or watching the movie. But before you even saw it or, or read it, somebody told you that the author had something you wanted to communicate about inner beauty versus outer beauty. So you knew that going in. And then you hear her name, Belle. Hmm. And you meet Gaston, who's outwardly beautiful but vacuous. Hmm. Hmm. And then you, you and um, as you experience the story, you would, it would be making sense to you. You would more likely be getting the message that the author intended you to get through the story. Because in a sense, as the story went along, you were making some connections of the things you were um, seeing or hearing to this theme of uh, inner beauty versus outer beauty. Because you see, it's possible to read a book or hear, hear a story and completely miss the point. Um, this happened to me recently. At my church, occasionally... They will put in the bulletin that anybody who wants to can read a particular book, and then on Monday night, anybody who wants to can come together and we'll talk about it. And so I saw in the bulletin that we were going to read a book by an author that's one of those authors that I, I, that everybody else seems to love, and I feel like I ought to like, but I've just never been able to get into. Okay, And so I was like, okay, I'm going to get that book, and I'm going to read it if it kills me. All right, and so I got the book, and I read it, and I remember setting it down on my nightstand, and um, it almost killed me. It almost killed me. <laughs> I, I remember saying to my husband, David, I finished that book. I have no idea what that book was about. 
So a little while later, I went to that great source of all knowledge. Yeah, 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 Google. And, and I typed in, what is the theme of the book? And I put in the title. I was like, oh, oh, oh. And, and I thought to myself, I kind of wish I had known that before I read the book that was in a, a genre of literature I'm not very adept at reading. And maybe it would have made more sense to me. Maybe I would have gotten the message that this author had. Well, I think the same thing proves true in regard to the Bible. That when we have a sense of what the big themes are in the story that the Bible is telling us, it really helps us to grasp and process the divine author's intended message as we read it. I think it helps us to understand why certain things are in there. Do you ever read the Bible and there'll be a little, it'll tell you a little something, you'll think, that's weird, I wonder why that's in there. I think biblical themes oftentimes help us make sense of that. I think understanding the themes of the Bible helps us to make much of what the divine author intends for us to make much of when we read the Bible. And it actually protects us or keeps us from making much of what the Bible doesn't intend for us to make much of. All right, so I, I, I had you turn to your partners and try to throw out the storyline of the book Beauty and the Beast. So I'm not going to ask you to do this, but I want you to imagine I was going to ask you, all right, go back to your partner. And this time, I want you to throw out the storyline for the book The Bible. How would you do? I think we all know where we'd start. We probably know where we'd go from there. Well, where would we go from there? And where would we go from there? And where would we go from there? Well, that's what we're going to focus on in this first session this morning, is getting a better grip on the whole storyline that the Bible tells to us. All right? So that's our first session. But then how about if I ask you to identify the theme or an important theme of the book, the Bible? I want you to think for a second, don't say it out loud, but maybe just think what might be a theme that would come to mind to you for this book, the Bible. Well, we're going to start into that in this first session, and then the second session, we're really going to dive in to uh, themes that the divine author has written into his book, that when we know them, it helps us to make better sense of the Bible's message. So that's going to be our second session. And then a third question might be, once we know what those themes are and have a sense of that storyline, what difference is that going to make? How can that help us when we're reading the Bible, hearing it preached, studying it, and we, we, we look at the Bible and we, we think to ourselves, I think I see one of those themes in there. How do these themes help guide, guide us to greater understanding? That's what we're going to do in the last session after lunch. So we have a lot to cover. Are you ready to go? All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so perhaps what we should do first is I want to define this term that I've given you as a, a biblical theology. And uh, so look in your workbook. I've written a definition. Let me read it with you. Uh, biblical theology is a way of understanding and approaching the Bible that recognizes that even though the Bible is made up of various kinds of literature and was written over centuries by 40 human authors, it is really telling one cohesive story about what the God is doing in the world through Christ. Biblical theology recognizes that the Bible has a number of central themes that span from Genesis to Revelation, each serving to communicate a coherent message about the person and work of Christ. Now, some of you get really nervous when you hear a word like theology. You think, oh, like, that's for people smarter than me, or that's for people more serious about the Bible than me. You know what? Theology is just the study of God. So really, as soon as you say, Jesus loves me, you're doing theology. 
okay? And so I don't want you to be intimidated by that word, but I want you to just grow in your understanding of this particular way of understanding who God is and what he's doing in the world. But there's actually all different kinds of theology. Um, there's also uh, there's historical theology. That would be a study of what has been believed about God throughout history. I think the kind of theology, or maybe what most of us think of when we think about the word theology, would be systematic theology theology or the study of doctrines. When I grew up, I wonder if some of you are like me, growing up, that's what I would have thought about as theology. So I want us to compare biblical theology to systematic theology. So look again at your page. In systematic theology, we ask what the whole Bible has to say about a particular topic, a topic such as sin, justification, the Holy Spirit, uh, the nature of God or humanity. And then we take all these things the Bible has said it, and, and we put it into a coherent summary. But by contrast, biblical theology then is more about tracing particular themes that develop. Now I want you to circle that word develop. This is a key word for understanding what we're doing today. We're looking for themes that develop over the course of the story of the Bible from creation all the way to consummation. And examples of themes in the Bible would be kingdom, sacrifice, feasting, temple. So systematic theology is an important companion to biblical theology. Now, if we're going to be trying to get a sense of uh, the, the, the story that runs from beginning to end in the Bible, maybe first we better really make sure we're really confident and clear about the parts that make up the Bible. So turn to page three in your workbook, and you see uh, this these uh, graphic representations of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's just make sure we're clear on the parts that make up the whole of the Bible. So let's group together those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, what do you want to call that section of the Old Testament? What? Law would be one. Law of Moses. How about Pentateuch? Have you heard that term? Pentateuch. Pent means five. So these would be the five books of the law or five books of Moses. All right. So let's call that the Pentateuch, these writings of Moses. And then let's group together the next group from Joshua all the way to Esther. And what should we call that part of the Old Testament? History. And when we say history, this is not the history of the world. It's the history of one people group, the people group through whom God is launching his redemptive purposes in the world. And essentially, if we're thinking about the story that the Old Testament tells, when we get about to the book of Nehemiah, we're actually chronologically at the end of the history that the Old Testament tells us. But we've got a lot more books here, don't we? All right, so let's see what we've got here. So then we've got Job to Song of Songs. What do you want to call that? Wisdom or poetry? I hear both words. Poetry, it's certainly in the poetic genre. I like to call it wisdom. I think of these books as being wisdom from God for his people so that they will know how to live in a world that doesn't work right because of sin. Uh, the book of Job shows us uh, how to live in a world in which innocent suffer. And Psalms are divine words given by God to us as his people to say back to him. Isn't it good of God to give us that? Here are words for you can cry out to me, even complain to me. Amazing. All right, so then the next group, we could divide it up smaller, but let's go all the way from Isaiah to Malachi. What shall we call those books? Prophets, prophets. Now, I wonder if some of you are like me in that if I were to identify the part of the Bible that I have studied the least over my lifetime, it would be prophets. Can anybody relate to that? You feel that way? Yeah. I, I, I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, you and I, when we read a book, we like to read things in chronological order. Thank you very much. And the whole of the Bible, including especially this part of the Old Testament, it like doesn't cooperate with us in that regard. 
These things are not offered to us in chronological order. And that, that's one of the things that makes it challenging. Just the genre of the literature makes it challenging. So as I have sought to try to make more sense in my mind of these books, one thing that has helped me is to think, okay, I'm going to go back to those history books, and I want to know when in the history being told did the events take place and did the people write these books that are in the prophetical books? And that just helps me make a little bit more sense of it. So if we took Isaiah to Malachi and we like squeezed it together to make it smaller and lifted it up, which books over there in the history books would we set it over? And we would set it over 2 Kings to Nehemiah. 2 Kings to Nehemiah. That would be the time period in history in which those prophetical books were being written and the situations that they address. All right, let's move to the New Testament. In the New Testament, uh, the first four books, those are probably the books of the Bible we're the most familiar with, aren't we? And what will we call them? Gospels. Each of these tell us the good news of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Uh, why do we need four, since they essentially tell the same story? Well, each of them is written to address a slightly different audience with a slightly different purpose. Um, the next book, Acts, maybe we'll let it stand alone. What should we call it? Here, I hear history, history of the church. Um, I've come, here's how I'm thinking about Acts these days, is that while the Gospels tell the story of Jesus's ministry while he was on earth, I think about Acts being, tells us the story of the history of Jesus's ministry from heaven after being ascended. Because what's kind of interesting about the books, book of Acts, while it does tell us how the gospel spreads and, and the church grows, it takes great care to let us know that Jesus is the one guiding the building of his church. He's the main actor, not the apostles. All right. Um, you know, we could take the whole, the rest of all of the books in the Bible and put them into one grouping, but I think we know that last book just a little bit different, don't we? Okay. So let's go from Romans to Jude. And what do you want to call that? Epistles or letters? So these are letters written by people like Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude. And some of them are written to whole churches, like the church at Ephesus and the church at Colossae, the church at Thessalonica. Others are written to individuals, like to Timothy or to Titus or to Philemon. Now, the thing is, that last book, we could call it an epistle because it's a letter. Who, who remembers what that who that letter is written to? The seven churches of Asia, remember this? Yes. So in many ways, it's it's like the others in that it's an epistle, but it's written in a, a form of literature that reminds us of the Old Testament, what? Prophets. And a, specifically, a few of the prophets who used a type of literature called apocalyptic prophecy. Reminds us of, in fact, he, John draws from Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and uh, Zechariah. And um, so we'll call that last one apocalyptic, apocalyptic. All right. So we've got uh, a, a sense of the makeup of the Bible. But I have to tell you, this, this brings up a gap that I have had in my life most of my life in regard to understanding the Bible. And I wonder if some of you are like me in this as well. I mean, my earliest memories are of being taught the Bible. I can remember being in my three-year-old Sunday school class. And I grew up in a family, we never missed church, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, vacation Bible school, everything, right? And um, I, um, I, when I went away to college, I studied Bible in college. It was my minor. I got a job at a Christian book publishing company right out of college. So I was working with Christian books and authors. But the truth is, for most of my life, I had a jumble of disconnected Bible stories in my mind, from the Old Testament especially. But I would have been kind of embarrassed for you to know actually how recently it was that I could have put any of those stories into chronological order to be able to demonstrate a real understanding of how that story was developing. 
And um, so, and the truth is, if you and I just have a collection of stories, what, what happens with those stories? We turn them into moral lessons of try harder to be like this person and try not to be like this bad person, right? But actually, remember what I said about about the Bible, that, that it's really one cohesive story centered on the person and work of Christ. And we want to understand it that way. And so we've got to get a sense of the storyline of the Bible. Um, so um, let's work on that today. All right? um, let's make it our goal that when we leave, we'll have a better sense of being able to articulate and put together in chronological chronological order this storyline of the Bible. So you see next that I've got a uh, timeline, a blank timeline, that you're going to be able to fill in however you want. Um, now let me ask, usually at these events, this is the time when I like to ask, who are my friends who brought colored pencils? <laughs> I see some, I see some, I see some. Let me just tell you what, this is your time to shine, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the rest of us, we've got boring black, blue, and um, you guys, it's going to be, woo, can't wait. All right. All right, so we're just going to try to, I'm, I'm going to tell the story of the Bible, and you can do whatever you want uh, with your timeline to try to have that help you get a sense of it. All right, so I know, we know where the story of the Bible begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, so it begins with creation, and it's interesting when we hear that story, uh, evidently God spoke this matter into being, but there were three issues with it. it it's, we read in Genesis 1-2, it was formless and void and darkness covered the waters of the deep, but it was not without hope because the Holy Spirit was hovering right over the dark waters. And right there in Genesis 1, God deals with all those issues. Um, he says, let there be light, and the darkness is permeated with light. He begins to bring form to the formlessness, night and day, um, light and dark, land and sea. So it begins to take shape. And then he also begins to fill it. Uh, he, he fills his earth with plants and seeds and with animals on the land and in the oceans and in the skies and he creates humanity man and woman and through them he fills his creation also with with love and relationship and meaning and purpose because he tells Adam and Eve he's, he he gives them a purpose you are to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth he says you're to exercise dominion over the creation. You're supposed to work and keep the garden. So get the picture. You, you, you've got, he, he created into being, but all the earth originally is, is still a wilderness, but he plants this garden there in the middle of Eden. And he says, Adam and Eve, you're going to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So I mean, they're going to have offspring who, like them, are made in the image of God and bear his glorious image. And as you are fruitful, you'll get more in number and you're working and keeping the garden. And the goal is that the boundaries of that garden would expand so, so that the day would come when the earth would be filled with the, the glory of the Lord and the whole earth would be a garden in which God dwells with his people who bear his image. That's the plan. But you also remember that important instruction. You can eat freely of every tree of the garden except for this one. And in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And then a serpent slithers into the garden, evil in the form of a serpent. And this serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. And I mean, look at this fruit. And she looks at it. And it looks good. It looks good. And she's wanting to be the smartest person in the room, you see. And she looks at it and she sees it's desirable to make one wise. And she takes and she eats and she gives some to her husband. And it's told very simply, but it just has cosmic disaster uh, impact in, in the world. Uh, and so then God comes on the scene. And he says some very important things in Genesis 14 and 15 
especially in Genesis 3.15. I don't know if you're a person who underlines your Bible, but if, if you are, or even if you're not, I think you need to have Genesis 3.15 underlined. It's one of the most important verses in the Bible. Y'all go ahead and turn there. Um, because without Genesis 3.15, you and I cannot understand the rest of the Old Testament and really the rest of the whole of the Bible because it sets the course for what we are about to read. Um, this, What God says to this serpent in Genesis 3.15, he says, I'm going to put enmity or think conflict between you and the woman. And so notice that that first line in Genesis 3.15, it's singular between you, the ancient serpent, and the woman. See it? It's singular. Look at the next line. The next line, it's plural. There's going to be this ongoing conflict between your offspring, evidently the serpent is going to have offspring, that's interesting, and the offspring of the woman. And they're going to be at conflict, constant conflict. And But then notice the last line. Notice it gets singular again. He will crush your head or bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. Well, this is interesting. So evidently there's going to be one particular offspring of the woman who one day is going to crush the head of this evil serpent. But in the process of it, his heel is going to be bruised. Or in other words, in other words he's going to suffer in the process of crushing the head of evil and putting an end to evil in the world. And so this means, this, this sets us on a course for the rest of the Bible because we're waiting and we're watching for that one particular offspring. Who will he be? When will he come? Uh, we discover pretty quickly it's not going to be Cain. And, um, and then we get to Genesis chapter 5. I wonder, it, it's, is it still January? I've kind of lost track. It's January, right? And so maybe some of you, you were like, okay, beginning of the year, I'm going to read the Bible through in this year. And uh, you started reading, and all you had to do was get to Genesis chapter 5, and it's just this long list of unpronounceable names. <laughs> and you're thinking, I'm not so sure about this. And as, as you got it, you thought to yourself you know what, I'm just going to skim through this because I don't really need to know this. I'm not even really sure why this is here. Well, the reason that we get bored with parts of the Bible like that is because we don't feel the tension we're meant to feel from Genesis 3.15. You see, Genesis 3.15, there's an offspring going to come who's going to put it into the serpent. And we get to Genesis chapter 5. So-and-so was born and he lived a certain number of years and then he, well, it's not going to be him. So-and-so lived a certain number of years, and then he, over and over again. So we're, we're, the reason that's important, we're looking, it's not going to be him. It's not going to be him. We're, we're still watching. Uh, so Adam and Eve, they're, they're ejected from the garden. They are fruitful and multiply. And then we get to Genesis chapter 6. And we discover that this sinners giving birth to sinners is not working out so well. In fact, we read that, that humanity is doing only evil all the time. And so God determines he's going to, he's going to wipe out humanity and start over again. He's going to preserve one family. So he's going to put Noah and his family in this ark. And judgment is going to rain down in the form of raindrops. And Noah and his family and those animals that are in there with him are going to be preserved in the judgment. And then we get to uh, Genesis chapter 9. They come out of the ark. They're kind of like a new Adam and Eve. In fact, they're given the same instructions Adam and Eve were given, which is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And that's what begins to happen. They begin to multiply. We get to Genesis chapter 10. Once again, a long list of names. These are the, the descendants and we're still watching and, and, and we get a hint even in Genesis chapter 10 of which of Noah's sons this promised one is going to come from Shem. Um, then we get to Genesis chapter 11. And do you remember that the instruction was? Be fruitful and multiply and what? Fill the earth. We get to Genesis chapter 11 and, and there's some people. They've gotten to the plain of Shinar and it says, and they settled there. And they're not interested in filling the earth with people who bear the glorious image of God so that the earth would be filled of God's glory. You know what they're interested in? Their own glory. 
and they 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 say to them they say to each other, "Hey, let's make a name for ourselves." Um, uh, and they say, "Let's build a big tower up into the sky, and it's going to be very impressive human project." See, this is about human achievement. And it's almost like they're going to build a tower up into the sky that's so high, like they're going to go up into the heavens and grab some of God's glory for themselves. And once again, God comes down in judgment and disperses the languages. Now, there is a seam here between Genesis 11 and 12 that for most of my life I never saw the significance of. But I think we really see it when we see that these people were saying, let's make a name for ourselves. And then we get to Genesis chapter 12. And there is this man named Abram. He's not looking for God. In fact, he lives in the land of Ur where they worship the moon god. And yet God comes to him and makes incredible promises to him. He says, Abram, I want you to go from your this land and your people, and I want you to go to the land that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. It's going to be something God does, not human achievement. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And then comes this amazing statement. And once again, it means more to us. If we're thinking back to Genesis 3.15, watching, he says, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay. So now of all humanity on earth, if we're watching for that one particular offspring, we know it's going to be an offspring of Abraham. And so uh, we're watching Abraham's family. Now, Abraham, first he has a son of the flesh, Ishmael. He's not going to be the one through whom this promise is going to be fulfilled and through the promise is going to run. And so then he has his son, who? Isaac. And Isaac has two sons, who? Jacob and Esau. And we actually know, even before Jacob and Esau are born, which one is going to be the one who's going to carry this promise of blessing, don't we? Remember, they struggle in the womb, and we learn that the the uh, the older is going to serve the younger. So even before born, we know, okay, this promised line, this is going to now come through Jacob. And then Jacob has 12 sons. And when we get to this in the book of Genesis, I know you guys at this church are going through Genesis. You're, 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 get, you're making your way there, right? I mean, you, when you get to this one, you, you kind of think, really, God, this is the family <laughs> through which you're going to bless the earth because they are a mess, these 12 boys, aren't they? They do some despicable, evil things, including throwing their brother Joseph into a pit and then selling him us off as a slave. Um... So when we come to the end of the book of Genesis, uh, Jacob and his 12 sons, they're all in Egypt. They have fled there uh, for food in the midst of the famine, where Joseph is now the um, right hand to the Pharaoh. And then we turn the page to Exodus, and it's 400 years later. And God's people are no longer welcomed guests of the Pharaoh. Now they're his slave labor force, and they are being severely oppressed. Remember, they're murdering those infant sons, and they're being worked hard, never a day of rest. And so what does God do? He sends them a deliverer, Moses, who leads his people uh, out of Egypt and across the Red, they cross the Red Sea, They go to Mount Sinai where they're given the law and told how they're to live when they get to that land that God had promised their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're heading to the land and they get there. Now God has told them that he's going to give them the land, but they don't really believe it. These people seem really intimidating that are there in the land. And so they're like, oh, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. And so God says, okay, great. Well, then um, you're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness until this generation all dies off and you're buried in the sand in the wilderness. And that's what happens. That's what we, that's what we read about in the book of Numbers. And um, then we get to the book of Deuteronomy. And now this is the next generation. 
and they're getting ready to move into the promised land. Now, here's how I think about the book of Deuteronomy. I wonder, have some of you, are you old enough that you have sent a child off, maybe to military service or to, they've left the house to have a job or to go to college or something like that. You remember this, moms? You remember that day? You're like standing at the curb and they've got all their belongings, they're moving into the dorm or whatever, and you're trying to remember everything you've ever taught them. (laughs) Remember to eat a green vegetable every once in a while. (laughs) Remember to call your mother, right? You're reviewing everything they need to remember for life apart from you. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Now you know the whole book, because that's what it is, okay? (laughs) Because that's what Moses is doing. The, The children of Israel are getting ready to go into the land of Canaan, but he's not going with them. And Deuteronomy, he's saying, remember this, remember this, remember, remember this when you get in the land. All right. So then we come to the book of Joshua. Moses is not going to lead them into the land, but Joshua is going to lead them into the land. And Joshua, um, the, the, the whole book, a lot of it, once again, we get a little bit bored with it because it starts naming all of these 12 tribes and then the clans among those tribes and the families amongst those tribes. And it tells us what land they're getting assigned and being given in the promised land. But at, and at this point, they are a loose federation of 12 tribes. There's no central government. And we discover the, a problem with that when we get to the book of Judges. Now, can we just agree that book of Judges, that's one dark book? All right. And when we get to the end of the book, it's the very last verse. It states clearly what the problem is. Do you remember? It says that... Um, that uh, everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes because there is, do you remember the next part? No king in Israel. There's a leadership crisis in Israel. And Judges ends and we wonder what God is going to do about that. And then we turn the page to the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth is a perfect example to me of a story in the Bible that to me For most of my life, I couldn't have told you where it happens in the story. It's just a nice story, isn't it? Don't we love this story of Ruth? And in some ways, we just want it to be timeless. It happened once upon a time, right? In some land. But actually, the writer of Ruth won't let us get away with that. Because here are the first words of the book of Ruth. In the days of the judges. So here, God is like, focusing in on one family, one clan, right, in in, in one little town in those days of the judges when over and over again terrible things are happening and they're crying out to God and we know the big problem is that there is no king in Israel. And so the book of Ruth, um, we might might love love, love the love story, but it's actually doing something more significant. And it's showing us something amazing, actually, that God is bringing a Moabitus. How's he going to solve the leadership crisis? He's going to bring a Moabitus into the family. That's kind of shocking, or at least it should be if we know the history. And so uh, and remember how the book ends, that um, Boaz and Ruth are married, and she gives birth to a child. But it doesn't just end there. Remember how it ends? And Boaz and Ruth had a son named... Obed, and Obed had a son named, and Jesse had a son named. Hmm. Now we see it. This is how God is dealing with the leadership crisis. He's going to give his people a man after his own heart, uh, the kind of king he wants for his people. And so we turn the book, page to First Samuel, and we discover first the people say, you know, here's the kind of king we want. And Saul, and that doesn't work out so well. And then David is put on the throne. And then we know who takes uh, the throne after David. It's who? Solomon. Now I have to say that this is the exact point in the Old Testament story that for me, for most of my life, it all starts to get fuzzy. I appreciate that shaking head to know that I am not alone with that. Um... Because, like, I could get to Solomon, but, like, all those kings after that, mm, don't have that, okay? And then we've got all of this uh, divided kingdom, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, go into exile, return. It's just been one big fuzzy mess. And 
here's the thing. This is the reason you and I don't read the prophets because it's all been one fuzzy mess. And so we don't want it to be a fuzzy mess anymore, so we're going to get it. Are you with me? All right. So Solomon's son takes the throne. Anybody remember who he is? Rehoboam. And Solomon, as wise as he was, he worked the people pretty hard and took a lot of their money. And Rehoboam is even worse. And so when he comes to the throne, all of the 10 northern tribes say to Rehoboam, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, we don't want you to be our king. So we're going to separate from these two southern tribes and we're going to, we're going to have our own king. And, uh, so from this point on in the Bible story, during this season of time where there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, when we read about Israel, we're not reading about the whole nation. We're reading about only the 10 northern tribes, which is important. And I'm telling you that because I feel like nobody ever told me that. All right, and so I, I didn't get that for a long time. So this section of the Bible, Israel, it's referring to the ten, only the ten northern tribes. And the two southern tribes, they're called what? Judah. Judah. It's two southern tribes. All right, now there are at least two things that Judah has that the northern ten tribes, Israel, doesn't have that are significant. Somebody want to try, what do you think they have down in Judah? What's one thing they have down here that they don't have up here? The temple. That's a good one. And think about this. This is the temple where God has come to dwell among them. And do you all, do you remember from like, um, Exodus and then from second Kings, how picky God was about the building and design of his temple? Well, the 10 northern tribes, they're like, ah, no big deal. You know what? We can build a temple. And so they build a temple, the kind of temple that they want to have. But the big problem is not only do they build a temple to Yahweh, the one true God, they build temples to many other gods, the gods of the Canaanites that they've never really moved out of the land. And so that means that the northern kingdom becomes idolatrous very quickly. They're worshiping many gods. And God determines that they are to be judged. And the way God is going to judge them is that he's going to use the world power of that day to bring judgment on them. And the world power of that day is Assyria. And so uh, Assyria sweeps in on the northern kingdom. And Assyria has a particular way of dealing with conquered people. What they like to do is move some people they conquer over here in here and move some of these people over here and just let's mix them all up so that they lose any sense of their original ethnic identity and will become good Assyrians. Um, and actually, this is an important part of the history in the Old Testament that helps us understand something significant in the New Testament. Because do you remember those people who live north of Jerusalem that the Jews hate? Who are they? And they're the Samaritans. Um, these are the descendants of Jewish people who intermarried with people from other nations uh, w- when Assyria conquered Israel. And that helps us understand maybe some of that tension and resistance. All right, it's 150 years later that the idolatry in the southern kingdom becomes significant enough that God determines it needs to be judged. And Assyria is no longer the world power of the day. Who is it now? Babylon. Babylon. And so Babylon, it has its own way of conquering people. And what it does is first wants to sweep in and pluck out the brightest and the best and take them over to Babylon and enroll them at Babylon University for a master's in Babylonian studies. And we actually know who some of those brightest and best were, right? Who do you think of first? Daniel. And then who else? Exactly. Exactly. And um, so, but then they go back and they gather up the Jews living in Jerusalem and in Judah, and they move them 500 miles east to Babylon. They settle them in a refugee camp by the Kibar Canal outside of Babylon. And uh, then they, they go back later and they destroy, tear down the temple and burn the city and destroy it. 
But the, the people of God, they're there living uh, outside Babylon, and they have a lot of prophets who are speaking to them. Some of them are false prophets, and some of them are true prophets. Now, here's what the false prophets are saying to them. They're saying, you know what? Don't get too settled in here, uh, because you know what? We are God's people. And God is not going to leave us here long. He's going he's gonna to take us out of here very soon. So don't put down any roots or anything, okay? And then they have true prophets like Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, you know, actually, you are going to be here for a while. In fact, you're going to be here how long? 70 years. Well, that's a lifetime. And so Jeremiah says, you know, build some houses and plant some vines and pray for the people you're living among because you're going to be here for 70 years. But know this, the Lord has plans for you. And one day he's going to, he, he, he plucked you out of the land and planted you here. One day he's going to replant you in the land. He is going to take you back. And uh, sure enough, 70 years later, Babylon is no longer the world power. Now it is the Medes and the Persians. And their leader is a man named Cyrus. And when we turn the page to the book of Ezra, Cyrus has come to power. And he's thinking, now why do we have all of these unhappy refugees living in these refugee camps outside Babylon? Let's send them home where they can work their land and be happy where they came from. And then we'll tax them heavily. And so Cyrus puts out this decree and he publishes throughout the kingdom, refugees, you can go home. And so that's what we read in the book of Ezra. And Ezra, he begins first, the first group of people he wants to take back are people from the Levite tribe. Why would that be important? What's their job? To rebuild the temple. That's job one. Get back to Jerusalem. Get the temple rebuilt. We read about that in the book of Ezra. And then we get to the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah's heart is broken because he's hearing uh, about, yeah, they, they've, they've done some work on the temple, but nobody even wants to live anywhere near it because the walls are broken down the city. It's not safe, and it's still a broken down city. And so he begins to take exiles back to rebuild the city. And essentially there, we're at the end of the story that the Old Testament tells us of the people of God. And these prophets are speaking. They're making all kinds of promises about almost unbelievable things that are going to happen in the future. But the Old Testament ends, and we're wondering, when is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? And then comes one of the most significant events in redemptive history. That's what we're tracing here, redemptive history. And I would mark it by a big arrow coming down right before I have Christ there on your timeline. And this would represent the incarnation of Jesus Christ that Christ comes into this world and takes on flesh. And so then we have in the Gospels the story of his righteous life, his sacrificial death. And so then right after the cross, I'd come up with enough just for three days and put a, line, a little arrow coming up that would represent his resurrection. And then just enough for 40 days... That would represent his ascension. Jesus returned to heaven. And now we got the rest of this line. And I know you're really hoping I'm going to tell you where we are on this timeline as we wait for the next big event in redemptive history. And the truth is I can't tell you exactly where we are, but I can tell you what's happening now is that God is gathering a people for himself, a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. To be his own. And we are living in this world awaiting the next big event on the timeline, which I would mark at the end of that line by a big arrow coming down once again. And what we are awaiting is the bodily return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And when he comes, he's coming in judgment and salvation. That day he returns, his Return day is our resurrection day. That's the day he's going to call to the dust of our bodies in the ground and 
We're going to rise from our graves. We're going to be rejoined with our spirits who have returned with Christ from heaven. And he's going to give us new bodies, bodies that will never die and bodies that for are fit for living forever with him, not somewhere away from this earth, but, but you see that day he returns, he's going to renew the creation. And this is where we read about the new heavens and the new earth. He's going to usher in the a new heavens and the new earth and give us bodies that are fit for living forever with him in the new heavens and the new earth. Now that's the story of the Bible. What a good story. What's a good story? And understanding that sequence of events helps us again and again and again as we study our Bibles. Now, I've used a lot of words to tell the story of the Bible. How about if we try to say it in four words, shall we? All right, so what would the first word be? Creation. Creation. And how about the second word? What do you think? Fall is fine. I've all, I, I've always said fall. I still do sometimes. I read this book recently where this guy said he doesn't like to call it fall because that sounds like an accident. And he says, he says, so he likes to use the word rebellion. So I put in rebellion, but either fall or rebellion is fine. And then a third word. What do you want to use for the third word of this story? Redemption. Redemption. Which it really runs from Genesis chapter 3 till about Revelation 20 is the story of redemption, right? And then how about a final word? What do you want to put? So I hear a number of things. I hear some restoration. That's what I would have said and I have said much teaching. I've, I've grown discontent with restoration. Um, and here's why. Because I think about if, if, if that's the story of the Bible, then the story looks like this. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And it seems to indicate a return simply to the way things were in Eden. And I think actually our future is better than Eden, okay? Because think about Eden. It was pristine. Um, everything was good. But Eden, Eden wasn't yet everything that God intended for the realm that he intended to share with his people. It's just a little garden inhabited by a few people. And he has this intention of a, 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 a world that is a garden filled with glorious image bearers. So it was limited, uh, more significantly, I think, Eden was a place, Eden was vulnerable. Adam and Eve were vulnerable. What were they vulnerable to? They were vulnerable to deception and sin. Think about God's own words to them. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They're vulnerable to death. And you see, the future that we are anticipating, we will not be, no longer be vulnerable to sin or deception, or death. That'll be gone for good. And so rather than simply saying restoration, and I heard some of you say this, I would say the fourth word should be consummation. Meaning, what God has intended to share with his people from the very beginning is going to become our reality. And, and, and the way the, the Bible story works is that Adam, God's first son, you see, if he had obeyed when he got to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if he had said, if he'd called good, good and evil, evil, he would have been able to lead his, all of his posterity into that consummation of all of God's good promises through his obedience. But we know, of course, he did not obey. He, he disobeyed. And so what, what, what we needed was another son who, when he was tempted in the wilderness, would obey. And, of course, that's exactly what Jesus did. And when he was tempted in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, he obeyed. And so whereas the first Adam failed to lead us into all that God has intended to us, let me give you some good news. The second Adam will not fail to lead us into all that God has prepared for us, his people. Amen? All right, so that's the story of the Bible. And um, I just want to, before I go on, I want to give you one quick picture, if you don't mind, about how my growing understanding of understanding the story has helped me personally, all right? 
I think that for most of my life, if you had asked me, what is the Christian life all about? I probably would have said to you something like, well, I make a decision for Christ and I try really hard to live for him. And then I go to heaven when I die. Sound familiar? And the truth is, all of that is true. But, but like, for one thing, did you notice the common denominator? I, 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 yeah. And it's true, but it's diminished. And what it, and, and the thing is, when I look at that storyline of what God is doing in the world through Christ, I realize that because I've become joined to Christ, my story is not defined by I, 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 but Christ, who he is and what he has done. All right, so if you ask me now, what do you think the Christian life is all about? Maybe I would say something like this, and I want you to hear how it's connected to that storyline we just drew. I would say, according to Ephesians 1, 3, before the foundations of the world, I was chosen in Christ to one day be holy and blameless before him. And when I came into this world, he wooed me to himself with gospel promises. And I took hold of them by faith. And when I did that, I became joined. The the Holy Spirit sealed me to Christ. And I can never be separated from him. And the Holy Spirit also came to dwell inside me and is at work in me, in the interior of my life, accomplishing a work of sanctification in my life. Now, it's a lifelong process. And... It will not be complete uh, before I die. And the day is going to come when I'm going to die. And when that day comes, they're going to put my body into the ground, but my soul or spirit is going to go to be with Christ. Right now, I am body and soul joined. But the day of death, what, what does Paul say? To be absent from the body, to be at home or present with the Lord. So my soul spirit's going to go to be with Christ. My body's going to go in the ground. And my body's going to turn back into the ground's dust. And that's the way things are going to be until the next big event on the timeline that we are waiting. The return of Jesus Christ. And 2 Thessalonians says that when he returns, all those who have died in Christ are going to come with him. So I'm coming with him. And he's going to call to that dust in the ground from my body. I don't know how he's going to do it, but somehow he's going to fashion out of that dust a new body for me. And um, I'm thinking he created Adam from the dust. He he can make a new body for me from the dust. And I'm going to once again be joined body and soul. And this time I'm going to have a body that's fit for living in his holy presence on a resurrected earth with him for all eternity. That's what the Christian life is all about. It's deeper, richer, more significant, isn't it? And can you see how getting that story enables us to get our own story right? All right, terrific. How am I doing? Oh, man, i got to go faster. All right, so take a stretch right here. It's a little bit warm. Don't, don't start talking, though. Don't start talking. Just, like, take a big stretch. All right? Stand up if you need to, but otherwise just stay there. Just take a little stretch and a little bit. I'll stop talking. So we have uh, gotten a sense of the storyline of the Bible. Let's move into this next idea about theme, shall we? All right, Um, if you ask theologians what is the theme of the most important themes of the Bible, they'll probably tell you one, one of two significant themes in the Bible. They'll probably say the most important themes in the Bible are kingdom or covenant. Two important themes. So here's what we're going to do in about 30 minutes before I release you for a break. I'm going to tell the story of the Bible again. Except this time, I'm going to tell it like through the narrow lens of this one particular theme of king and kingdom. 
Right? Now, in many ways, I like to say, just like sit back and relax and listen to the story, but I don't really want you to do that. I, I want you to work harder than that. And so um, I want you to see if you got page four that has the outline for this king and, and kingdom. And there's four things in particular I want you to really listen for as I tell the story this way. Number one, I want you to listen for how I'm going to touch on every part of the Bible. Pentateuch, history, wisdom, prophets, gospels, okay? Listen for that. I want you to listen for um, the way in which each part of the Bible develops this theme. Remember that key word? It's developing. So it's not like I'm going to give you a summary of the Bible's teaching about the kingdom. I'm telling you a story that begins and then has a crisis and there's developing action and it's going to come to a climax and a resolution. Now, the third thing I want you to listen for is where the climax comes in this story. And just a little hint for you, no matter what theme in the Bible you're tracing, the climax always comes in the same place. It always comes in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it always resolves into the same uh, reality, which is the new creation or the new heavens and the new earth. So you set for listening for those things. One more thing I want you to listen for. Uh, I want you to listen for the way in which this idea or theme of king and kingdom gets communicated in the scriptures, not necessarily using that word. So, so think for a second. Can you think of a word in the Bible that when you read it, you should probably think king, kingdom, or an image in the Bible? What are some th ideas? What do you think? What? Throne, love it. What's another one? Crown, love it. Reign, dominion, authority. Exactly. These things, can you see how they're kind of communicating king, kingdom? It's not the exact same word. All right, so you set to listen? All right, so I, I smiled a while ago. This friend of mine, Gabe DeGarmo, in fact, I got a text from him yesterday. He he put up a post on Instagram, and it was a picture of his wife and daughter at the airport, and they were going to Orlando. And he said, uh, look out, Disney. I'm on my way with two more princesses. <laughs> Isn't this interesting about Disney stories? How many of them are about what? A prince and a princess, a king and a kingdom. And why is it we love these kind of stories so much? I wonder if maybe they, uh, the reason they capture our interest is because they, um, reflect some childlike longing that we've, that, that we have had that, that maybe we've trained ourselves to deny, but yet there's something inside us that knows there really is a kingdom in which we could be cherished by the prince and protected and provided for by the king, a, a, a kingdom in which we enjoy perfect safety and abundant provision where we can finally feel at home. And I would say to you that this is not the fodder of fairy tales, but actually it is the story that the Bible holds out to us. That the Bible is the story of a true king who enters and, and rules over his people with perfect love and justice. And the story of this king and this true king and the kingdom begins not with once upon a time, like a Disney story, but rather in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the Bible begins by telling us that God is the majestic king uh, over uh, the heavens and the earth that he has created from nothing. And we read that Adam and Eve lived in this garden paradise called Eden. And they lived there. Remember, they were to exercise dominion. They're living there as vice regents of the great king. So this is the kingdom of God as it once was. It is God's people, and they're living in God's place under God's rule. And we're going to see that throughout the Bible, that's always the definition of God's kingdom. But it just changes. Because here, who are God's people? Adam and Eve. And they're living in God's place, the Garden of Eden. And they're living under God's rule, this instruction to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, exercise dominion, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. 
But of course, we know what happened to this kingdom. A rival kingdom invaded the kingdom of Eden in the form of a serpent. And this serpent said to Adam and Eve, the vice regents of God, you know what, your king, you think he's good? He's not really that good. He's actually withholding good things from you. And actually, you could be kings and queens in your own kingdom if you just do what I suggest you do. And they believed it. And so essentially what they did was transfer their loyalty from the true good king to this king, this ancient serpent. And uh, because of this, everything that was once so beautiful in Eden became broken, and they were ejected from God's kingdom of Eden. But God the good king was not content to allow this ongoing alienation from his people. And so he began working out his plan to bring his people back to his kingdom. And he decided to do this not through an instantaneous edict, but rather through a lengthy historical process. And he began this process when he went to one man, Abram, and made incredible promises to him. He said to Abram that he was going to be the leader of a great people. And that he was going to give those people a place, a land, the land of Canaan, where they would live under his righteous rule. And it is a couple of generations later, after Abraham goes to this land that God has given him, that he, um, his, his grandson Jacob is lying on his deathbed in Egypt, uh, where they've gone seeking food in the famine. And as he lies on his deathbed, he's calling each of his sons to come in. He wants to speak a blessing over them. Now, I think everybody must have been holding their breath to hear what Jacob was going to say about Judah. Because Judah has done some very despicable things. So they must have been really shocked when they heard what Jacob had to say about Judah. Here's what he had to say. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter, the scepter, will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until, until, until what? Until the coming of the one. The one, the promised one, the promised offspring to whom it belongs the one whom all nations will honor. Do you hear it? A king is coming. A lion from the tribe of Judah. One of Judah's descendants is going to be a ruler whom all nations will honor. Now the family had entered as Pharaoh's welcome guests, but they became his slave labor force. And so what did God do? He sent them a prince. A prince who brought them out of Egypt and led them to the land that he was giving to them. And this uh, land, do you remember what he called it? He said it was flowing with milk and honey. It was meant to be reminiscent of the garden paradise that God's people, Adam and Eve, had once enjoyed. And here's the thing. If they, if God's people obeyed him there in this new land, then they would enjoy its abundance forever. This is the kingdom in the promised land. And Moses told them that they were to be a kingdom of priests. And meaning that they were to be a blessing to all of the other nations around them. How were they supposed to bless the other nations around them? By being distinct from them. So that people of other nations would look at Israel and their relationship to their God. And they would say, we want that. And so they would stream toward Yahweh. But here's the problem. The the nation of Israel, they didn't want to be distinct from all the other nations. They wanted to be like the all, the all the other nations. And you see, all of the other nations, you know what they have? They have a human king who rides on a big stallion leading the nation into battle. And they say, we want that. Okay. And so they uh, go to Samuel, their judge, and here's what they say to him. Yeah, they have a proposal. They say, appoint for us a king to judge us like all of the other nations have. 
Now, their problem is not so much that they want a king. I mean, we had that, we had that uh, prophecy over Judah. And if we had stopped in Deuteronomy, we would have heard Moses saying, in the day that God gives you a king, here's what the king is supposed to do. And here's what he is supposed to be like. So it's not that their desire for a king was evil. Their problem was that they wanted the wrong king at the wrong time for all of the wrong reasons. And um, Saul, that first king, he was tall and handsome. I mean, he looked positively kingly on that horse, leading them into battle. But he was a failure as a king because he refused to obey God. And so Samuel went to Saul one day and said this. He said, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be a prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So he's saying, Saul, he's a king that was after the people's hearts, the kind of king they wanted. I'm going to give them a king after my own heart, the kind of king that I want for my people. And so, um, David was anointed king. It took a long time before he actually became king over all 12 tribes, but that day came. He took the mountain city of Jabus and made that his royal city of Jerusalem. And there he built himself a royal palace. And I kind of wonder if one day he's, he's in his beautiful royal palace and maybe he's looking out the window and he sees this 400-year-old tent that the God he loves and serves lives in. And the disparity between these two things, he's like, there's something wrong with this. And so I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a temple for God. Seems like a good idea. Uh, But then the next day, the prophet Nathan comes to him speaking for God to David, and, and this is what he says to him. He says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Well, to get this, we have to understand that the word house is being used three ways in this passage. There's a house like a king lives in, and that's a palace. And there's a house like a a deity lives in, and that's a temple. But what God is saying here is I'm going to make you a house. And I think the way, at least for us in the States, and it may be the same case for you, the way we hear this term used most often in this context would be talking about the house of Windsor. What is the house of Windsor? Well, it's a dynasty of kings, the dynasty of the kings in England. And so God is saying to David, I'm going to turn your family into a dynasty of kings. And this is an incredible promise. And then he says, and when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. So God promises he's going to establish a dynasty from David that his son is going to sit on his throne. That happens in Solomon's day. He says that his son Solomon is going to build a house for him. And sure enough, that happens in Solomon's day. But then we read this. The the verse continues in, in verse 16. It says, he says to David, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And if we're thinking deeply, we're not sure what to do with this promise because there did come a day when there was no son of David seated on the throne in over in Israel, in Jerusalem. And not not only is there no son of David sitting on the throne, there's no throne. Actually, God's people have been taken into exile, and it seems that all hope for a king and a kingdom are lost. And remember how I told you that the Psalms are divine words given from God for God's people to say back to him? God was good during this season when they're wondering what has happened, to actually give God's people words to cry out to God. And so we find this in Psalm 89, written while they're in exile, thinking that God's promises were not coming true. And he gives them words to actually cry out to God about that. So we read in Psalm 89 that they they are singing, Lord, 
Where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Their, their words of a lament that there's no king, there's no throne. They're, they're questioning whether or not God is proving true to this promise that he made to David. And so while the psalmists are giving them words, assuring, uh, giving them words to cry out to God to send his king, the prophets are speaking for God to his people, encouraging them to hold on to their confidence that, yes, God is going to send them a king, a son of David, and to not give up hope. In fact, uh, the prophets tell them many things about this king and his kingdom and what it's going to be like. So, for example, the prophet Isaiah describes to them what his government is going to be like, this king, when he comes. He says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Or the prophet Jeremiah, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, I, I wonder, thank you, that's kind of you, I, I wonder if you noticed in both verses what the prophet said the kingdom of this king was going to be like, what's going to mark this king. Do you see it there? Justice and righteousness. And so just as an aside, can I just ask you, does that not sound good to you? We live in a world of so much injustice and corruption and unrighteousness. We long for this, don't we? Uh, the prophet Zechariah, he seems to see into the future by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, behold, your king is coming to you Righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And he shall speak peace to the nations. And his rule will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So the Old Testament prophets, they're, they're calling people constantly, hold on to that promise that God made to David. But then... The prophets stopped prophesying. And there was just 400 years of silence from God. Do you feel it? And then finally... The day came when God sent his angel Gabriel to a young woman living in Israel in a time when a cruel puppet king sat on the throne over Israel. And the angel told Mary that she was going to have a son. But this isn't going to be just any baby. Uh, this is going to be the son, the offspring, the king that generations had been longing and waiting for ever since God made that covenant with David. Here's what the angel said. He said, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. You see, when Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem, the promise uh, that God had made to David was fulfilled. David's son had come to take David's throne, and all that the whole kingdom of Israel had been pointing toward for generations was becoming a reality with the coming of the true king. This is the kingdom of God at hand. In fact, those are the first words we hear from Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. First words, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't really seem like a king. I mean, kings are born in palaces, not cattle stalls. And uh, kings expect everyone to serve them. They don't go around serving other people. 
and kings wear royal robes. They don't wrap themselves in a towel and go around washing everyone's feet. And yet, throughout his ministry, Jesus was constantly pulling back the curtain, especially in his ministry of miracles. He was pulling back the curtain, allowing the people of his day to see into what this world will be like when his kingdom is not merely at hand, but when it actually comes in all of its glorious fullness, because that is yet to be. So as he healed people with diseases, he was showing them that his kingdom, when it comes, that, that sickness and disease and death will have no place in his kingdom when it comes. And as he um, commanded demons to depart, he was demonstrating that evil will have no place in his kingdom when it comes. And as he fed multitudes, and there's 12 baskets of food left over, he's showing them the abundance of his kingdom when it comes. Uh, we sing a song at Christmas. I'm guessing you do too. Do you sing the song? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Now here's the thing. S- sung that, sang that all my life, and I always thought that that song was about his first coming because we sing it at Christmas time. But I want you to think with me for a minute. Can that song really be about his first coming? Because we know in his first coming, earth did not receive her king. We rejected the king. Instead of bowing down to the king, uh, humanity conspired against him and actually handed him off to a foreign ruler to be crucified like a criminal criminal. Rather than bowing to this king, they mocked him as king. They spit on him as king. And instead of placing a crown of honor on his head, they pressed a crown of thorns into his head. We read in the Gospel of John that the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest, get this, the chief priest, who should have known he was the king, answered, We have no king but Caesar. And so delivered him over to them to be crucified. Pilate also wrote an inscription and he put it on the cross and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. All those years of longing and waiting for their king to come and when he came, they didn't want him. You see, because they were like the people of Saul's day who wanted a a warrior king who would lead them into battle. So the people of Jesus' day wanted a warrior king who would free them from the rule of Rome. But you see, Jesus came the first time not as a warrior king, but as a shepherd king. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep, but I will take it up again. And sure enough, that's what he did. He laid down his life for his sheep, and he did take it up again. You see, just as... uh, God lifted up David from tending his father's sheep out there on the hillside and set him on the throne of Israel. So God raised up Jesus from the tomb and the grave and set him on David's throne. And because his throne lasts forever, or because Jesus lives forever, his throne will last forever forever. Putin's rule over Russia, it's not going to last forever. Kim Jong-un's cruel starving of his people in North Korea, it's not going to last forever. ISIS reign of terror in the Middle East, it's not going to last forever. Whoever gets elected to live in the White House for the next four or years, it's not going to last forever. Whoever is the president of Kenya, It's going to be five years or ten years. It's not going to last forever. But my friends, the rule of King Jesus will last forever. Today, 
The kingdom of God is spreading across the world as the gospel goes out and is embraced by all who repent and believe. This is the kingdom as it is now. The kingdom's no longer bound up with one nation. Uh, that was always a picture of things to come. And the kingdom comes now as people bow to King Jesus. So as Jesus rules and reigns in your life, that's the kingdom. And as Jesus rules and reigns in his church, that's the kingdom. Now, in the days after the ascension of Jesus, the emperor who sat on the Roman throne was demanding to be addressed as Lord and God. And uh, those who called Jesus Lord and God were being severely persecuted. And the Apostle John was one of those people who just would not stop talking about his true king, Jesus. And because of that, he was arrested and sent to live on a rocky island prison on the Isle of Patmos. And while he was there, God enabled him to see who is truly seated on the throne of the universe. And he wrote it down for us so that we can see it. John writes, I looked and behold, a door open in heaven. And at once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven and one seated on the throne. So as John peers into the heart of ultimate reality beyond the time and the space of this world, what does he see? What he sees is a throne and not simply a throne, an occupied throne, a throne occupied by the one who calls himself in the book of Revelation, both the root and the offspring of David. My friends, the centerpiece of heaven is not going to be many mansions made of gold, although I'm sure they'll be wonderful. And the glory of heaven is not going to be the sounds of angel chorus, although I am sure that they will sound glorious. And I say this gently to those of you who, look like me, longingly look forward to someone you love who has gone to Christ's presence before you, that actually the most compelling part about heaven will not actually be seeing those we love who have gone before us. Because you see, the centerpiece of heaven, the focal point of the universe, is the son of David seated on the throne, ruling and reigning and providing a safe place for his people to rest, giving them all of the benefits of his kingdom and refusing to ever let anything ever harm them again. I started by telling you about my friend Gabe who tweeted that picture on Instagram of his wife and daughter heading to Disney World, promising Disney that he was on his way with two more princesses. And he, he posted another picture a few days later. And uh, it was a picture um, of Main Street in Disney World that ends, and at the end you see this big castle. And here's what he said with, with that picture. He said, looking forward to the day I get to be in a real kingdom with the king. And when I read that, I said, me too. Because you see, as, as good as it's going to be to be living in a kingdom when there is no more sickness and no more sorrow and no more death, the best thing about the kingdom will be the king seated on the throne at the very center. And you see, his kingdom is going to come. Uh, he is going to come. He left us with this promise saying, behold, I am coming soon. This, my friends, when he comes, this will be the kingdom as it will be. It, the goal of God's work throughout history is actually the very thing that Jesus taught us to pray for. What is it we pray? Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And you see, one day that's going to happen. 
God's people, who will it be then? It will be all of those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we're going to live in God's place, the, the new creation, and we're going to live forever in his kingdom under the gracious rule of the king of kings. And as I close, I, I just have to ask you a question. Has this king become your king? Have you ever come under the authority of this king? It's actually the most significant question of your life as you look toward the future and anticipate your own future. Have you come under the authority of this good king? And I have to tell you, if you have, I have incredible news for you. And it is this, that there is a day coming in your future. And on that day, you're going to hear a very loud voice. And here's what that loud voice is going to say. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And when we hear those words, it's going to be the best news that we have ever heard. In fact, I think it's worth singing about, don't you? So let's sing.